Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform, and the details for that are below in the description. We want to be praying for you, and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au, and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. Father, we, we relate um, quite closely uh, with King David, who started by laying out his petitions before you um, in his prayers. And we think of the, the challenges that we face globally uh, with wars and political unrest, uh, with people being uh, oppressed and challenged. And as soon as we start mentioning all these things, we become overwhelmed. I thank you that in all these things, Lord, um, we can place them uh, in your hands and take them off our hearts and not be concerned uh, any further or anxious but in fact can um, place our hope in you I thank you that for some of us uh, you call us to action be that in giving or caring or sharing or putting people right uh, when they have um, wrong opinions about what's happening in the world. We recognise the brokenness of the world and we ask for your heart to be poured out into our hearts uh, so that we can reach out and touch uh, those around us. We think of the way that we are doing that through our, uh, our mission partners locally in the Northern Territory and uh, overseas in Thailand and Cambodia. We pray that through this connection, uh, we can give hope into those communities. We pray that as we think about the, these bigger problems, that you'll draw our heart to be praying specifically for each of those situations, uh, for growth and acceptance within the community in the Northern Territory, in Cambodia for opportunities to heal and help, uh, particularly uh, women and those that have been caught in slavery. Help them to be able to grow their own food and build their own lives. For those in Thailand to hear your message and nearby countries as they serve there. So this is how we can uh, contribute, Lord, and I pray that you would uh, drive that into our hearts uh, to be connected in those spaces. Close at home, we have people who are struggling illness and injury. We pray that you will uh, bring rapid healing and recovery uh, and a heart that is at peace about the healing process. We pray for this community as we begin the year. I know that some kids have already started school and some are about to start. And that puts stress onto families and I pray that that stress might be put aside as we contemplate uh, your hand in the midst of all of this big story uh, that is our lives. Pray that you'll give us the heart to see you in the midst of each of those events that come upon us uh, in the coming days as we get our kids ready for school and into the whole process of another year. For our mission and ministry here in this church, I pray for, uh, for Nathan and the team as they uh, prepare for the coming year. May you bless them uh, with inspiration uh, to draw us close to you so that we can show you to the community in which we live. 
Open our hearts and minds to this message, Lord. Pray for Gary as he brings his message to us today that we can uh, see your heart in the message that he brings to us. Amen. Our Bible reading this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. O praise the greatness of our God. He is the rock. His works are perfect, and all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Earlier this week, when I was contemplating what the Lord would have me speak on today, and what he said to me was, just worship me, just worship me. I want to compliment Cassie, in your choice of worship songs today, because they were beautiful. It's what God wanted. He clearly spoke to you as he spoke to me. It's all about me. He is an amazing God, as the words of that song said. You know, we we need to be reminded in this desperate world to ascribe greatness to our God to move into him even more than we have in the past, to hold his name up as the Holy One, to bless him, to worship him, to acknowledge him. Oh, we need a God now. So more than ever, we need that God of greatness. Deuteronomy 32 is called the Song of Moses. And it's not actually a song, it's, it's a poetic utterance. God told Moses to tell the people of Israel to worship me. And so Moses stood up before all of Israel and he proclaimed the words which are in the song, but uh, pretty well most of Deuteronomy 32. And after he had proclaimed the greatness of God and after he had said to Israel, we are to worship this God and ascribe greatness to him, God spoke to Moses and God said, now I am going to take you up to Mount Nebo and I want to take you up to Mount Nebo because I want you to see the land that I have promised to your people. This is the land of Canaan that I am giving to your people. But he said, I'm not giving it to you, for you shall die on Mount Nebo. Joshua will lead your people into Canaan and conquer it. Imagine being told, that you are to go up the mountain and you would never come back again. What an awesome utterance from his God. But before he did that, chapter 33, he again called all of Israel before him and he said to them, I want to bring a blessing from the almighty God of greatness. I want to bless you. And so he uttered, words of blessing to all of Israel. And he also brought individual blessings to each of the 12 tribes and to the leaders of the 12 tribes. All this he did before taking his journey to Mount Nebo. Today, We're going to look at these five key elements which were in that song, which come out of Deuteronomy 32, 3 and 4. They are God's attributes and God is not, he is limitless. So these are not the only attributes of God. These are those that were chosen here um, by Moses to acknowledge the greatness of God. His work is perfect. We are not. All his ways are just. Ours are not. 
He is a God of faithfulness. We are not. He is without injustice. We are not. Good and upright is he. Again, we fail on that score. Let's pray and ask him to lead us through the rest of the message. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we do indeed thank you for you are great. You are the creator of the earth, the universe, the many universes, all things. You are the God that we worship. We worship today. We desire to worship in our heart and our spirit. We desire to worship you every day. Lord, speak into our hearts this morning and particularly speak into my heart, Lord, that I may bring the words on my lips that are the words you, that you have chosen. For this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Desmond Tutu was fairly well known in his day as Bishop of Johannesburg uh, and the Archbishop of Cape Town. One of the things he had to say is that hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. And those words back in the 1990s couldn't have been more true then than they are today. We do indeed have a hope or we should have a hope looking to our future and to the promises that our Lord has given us. All too often, hope is defined as a maybe, an idle dream, something which we may or may not take or may or may not eventuate. But here in Psalms, we see in Psalms 33, the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those who hope is in his unfailing love. So we have a hope in the Lord for those that sit under the authority of our God, for those who love Jesus, for those who have an unfailing love in him and his faithfulness. The eyes of the Lord watch each and every one of us. The eyes of the Lord, they watch the nations. And quite frankly, we must rise against every situation that we face worldwide, nationally, individually. Every situation we need to rise above with that real sense of hope that he has given us. Otherwise, it simply becomes an option. But it's not an option. Our hope, the Lord tells us, is what we are to hang on to in desperate times, in good times. We are to hang on to that hope that our Lord God has given us in Jesus Christ. His eyes are on those who fear him. Our hope is based on our relationship individually with Jesus. The first of those attributes, his work is perfect. Well, the first thing I want to say about that is what an amazing God. A God who is so awesome, a God who is so worthy of humanity bowing before him, a God who is so esteemed by those who love him, a God who is, as Deuteronomy says, our God the rock. And the rock is dependable in all things, in all situations. Our God, the rock, is dependable. I ask you this question. What else in life compares to our God, the rock? Because nothing, nothing else today is dependable. Nothing else today is rock solid. Nothing else today is eternal. Nothing can give us a firm foundation for living. In Psalm 66, come and see what God has done, how awesome his works in man's behalf. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Two key things there. 
How awesome are his works. They are beyond description in human terms. And his eyes, his eyes are on every nation. What's happening over in Europe or in the Ukraine, Russia? What's happening with America and the way that it is looking at what's happening? Uh, The tensions seem to be rising. They seem to be building up day by day. But we have an assurance that our God is watching. Our God is not a distant God who just stands back and lets humanity annihilate itself. His eyes watch the nations because his timing is perfect. His works are perfect. And all that he does is in favour of those who love him. You know, when I am asked from time to time, which I am, by a non-Christian, show me that there is a God. How do I know there is a God? I always point to creation in all its majesty. From the tiniest cell that becomes a human baby to the universe, and they think probably more than one universe, the universe, the galaxies, solar systems, planets, nature, everything that God has created, how can you compare that? You know, we can talk about humanity coming out of a single cell, out of a a swamp. We can talk about that. But that doesn't explain the starry heavens. That doesn't explain the sun, the earth, the planets and all of those things that God has created. None of the theories of creation except for the biblical story of creation and the awesomeness of our God can provide an answer. It is the only answer. In Isaiah 40 at verse 25 it says, To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all of these? He who brings out the starry host one by one and he calls each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. I don't know if you can get your head around the fact that God knows every every being, every one of his creation. He knows individually by name, by character. He knows, as it says in Isaiah, he knows the stars by name and not one of them is missing for it was his desire that they should be as they are. The second attribute, all his ways are just. Like me, do you sometimes wish the Lord would deal with the wickedness in the world today and deal with it, put an end to it? I know I do, but we mustn't forget his promise that a time is of his choosing when he will bring true justice to the world. It's his choice. It's not my choice or what I want or hope for. It's what God has decided in the very beginning and decides today. Wilfred Peterson was an American author and a a media commentator. He was back in the 1900s, 1900 to 1995, and this is what he said. The world needs less heat and more light. It needs less of the heat of anger, revenge, retaliation, and more light of ideas, faith, courage, aspiration, joy, love, and hope. That was written in the middle of last century somewhere. I haven't got a date when he wrote that, but about the middle of last century. And those words couldn't be more true then than they are today. Certainly, we need those things. We need to get rid of the heat of anger and, and, and meanness. You know, me, as in me, mine, what I want. Get rid of anger, retaliation. We need more ideas. We need more faith. We need more courage, more aspiration, more joy, more love and more hope. Goodness me, they're all biblical. 
We need more of what God has given us. We are reminded that from the beginning, the Lord has ruled with justice. In Psalm 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. This is a God that ensures the widows and the orphans are looked after. He heals the cripples. He blesses the fatherless. Why then does the world think his justice can be flaunted? Why do people think everyone, no matter what they do or who they are, has a right to go to heaven at the end of their life? But the Bible tells us only the righteous shall inherit eternal life. The third attribute is a God of faithfulness. Can there be any doubt that he is faithful in all that he does and in all that he tells us? That his love and his faithfulness is just as powerful today as it was in the time of Moses and before that. Psalm 100, for he is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. There it is, quite clear. The things of God, his love, his grace, his faithfulness, his greatness, they don't die with our forefathers. They are here today. They'll be here for our children tomorrow and our children's children because that's the God that we worship, our eternal creator, the one who loves us so dearly, the one who cares about us so much. But we live in a world today where truth and faithfulness in people is virtually absent. The popular media is particularly potent in gotcha moments. The depths that popular media go to prove that someone is wrong or can't be trusted, that essentially erodes our trust. Four years ago, I was asked by a political party to stand in the state election in the seat of Orange, and I did that. But I've got to say to you, I am so glad now that I was not elected. I feel I can better remain true to my Lord where I am today. Because of his faithfulness, I am and you are ambassadors for Christ in all that we do. The fourth attribute, a God without injustice. Now, attribute two said all his ways are just and you could say, isn't that saying the same as this is a God without injustice? But two was about his actions. It was about what he does. He always acts in a just way. And we see that in the actions of God to us, to the people of the world. But this one is about the very nature of God. It's about who he is. He is a God of justice. He is a God that doesn't hold qualms against any person. He is just and he is able to rule as a judge because he is permanently a God of justice. He is always relating to us without injustice. And if that's true, then surely when he speaks to us or he communicates to us in such, such uh, uh, in any way at all, he does that with absolute assurance of uh, for us that we are being treated fairly. We are being treated fairly by him, even when we don't think we are. Have you ever said, well, you know, perhaps in other circumstances that might be true for me, but... I've experienced times when I had doubts about something only to realise later that yes, our Lord was absolutely right, I was not. I've had those times in my life. I thought I understood what his will was for me and it wasn't. I didn't clearly listen carefully enough to what he was saying. When we pray, he hears. 
when we pray and we ask for something. He answers prayer, every prayer, even a, a prayer, excuse me, when we don't seem to be able to see the answer. That is his answer. Number five, good and upright is he. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. It's hard to see that sometimes when the world goes to the extents that it does in hurting people, in hurting Christians. But God guarantees in his word that we will be blessed as we take refuge, move in closer, as we, as we move into his heart and we allow his loving arms around us to forget everything else going on in the world except the arms of Jesus saying, it's okay, I'll look after you because I care for you, I love you, you are mine. Do you see the benefit for us from his goodness? That blessing as we move into him. But are good and upright the same thing? But just quickly, the dictionary says good is desirable qualities and distinguishable qualities. Ones you can see and ones that are good, but that's on human terms. Which humans decide what is good? Whilst it says uprightness is moral integrity. Whoops, humanity fails on that one, doesn't it? Moral integrity. Uprightness also is complete honesty. Whoops, humanity misses on that one. Also, it's equity in principle. Equity in principle. That means uh, being just and fair. Doesn't necessarily mean making everyone the same as everyone else, as the world would have it. Being just and fair. Again, we fail that one. Because we have a Lord who is good and upright, we can rely on his faithfulness. The world ignores the source of moral integrity and honesty at its peril. We truly do need to ascribe greatness to our Lord. We need to ignore societal pressures to conform. Our standards and structures are being eroded every day. And Jesus gave us a warning about that, that such a time would come. And I'm going to finish with this reading. This is from Matthew 24, starting at verse 36. And these are the words of Jesus just warning us and telling us where we would end up in a time such as this. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark, and then they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, the other left. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know on what day our Lord will come. A truer word has not been uttered as we close this message. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks, Lord, that you are a saviour who came to teach us about your word, that you are a Lord who has promised that you will be faithful and just 
and you will look after those who love you. Oh God, we just want to press into you today. We just want to press into you more and more. The louder the world gets, the more difficult things become. Lord, take us by the shoulders and bring us into your embrace that we should feel the warmth of the one who loves us, cares about us and gives us an eternity of peace, grace and blessing. For this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, we'll see how great